Right. So, we'll be good. So that doesn't do that at all. That's just a, that needs to be corrected in Google. And uh, so hopefully I'll, man, Lola can do that for me uh, after after class, although I need to give back to teach uh, the residents here really, really quick. Really quick. Um, so, I believe what the class kind of wants to do is for these neurophysiology example questions uh, possibly meet on Friday at 7.30 to go through those. For those of you who want to, totally voluntary, totally voluntary. And um, do take a look at them rather than going one at a time through here. Um, you know, I just might ask, okay, let's look at page one. What do you want to go over on page one? If there's some items you just don't want to go over, that's fine with me. But whichever items you ask, we will go over and we'll go over those, the items that we go over extremely thoroughly so that those of you who went through uh, the dissection last time, you kind of know that, well, we, we spent uh, more than 45 minutes to go over seven questions, but the first seven questions, but we went over more than half the concepts on the exam. So we'll do something like that. And then there will be, uh, not sure when you're going to get them, but it might be Sunday night, it might be early, early Monday morning, some example cardiovascular system questions. So you can work on those and go through them and uh, feel a little bit better about life, hopefully. Yeah? Um, when, or like when does the information stop the test here? We need to get to a I think it's going to be at the, we need to get to a conceptual breakpoint. We're going to see where we are today. Okay. We're going to see where we are today. My guess is it's going to be actually sometime on Thursday. Okay. But I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so um, we're still talking about what goes into the heart and what comes out of the heart. And I told you just to make sure this is kind of the last thing I had up, wasn't it? And although you don't have it in your notes, is this the, uh, yeah. this is kind of the last thing. Contractility, there's, I'm going to add a little bit more to something. But there's two primary ways of regulating stroke volume, how much blood is ejected in the speed. One is by the Starling Law of the Heart or the Frank Starling Mechanism, which I'm going to show another slide on that. The other is contractility, and this is contractility. And so this is kind of where we end it off. I asked you, look at this table, 12.5. I think it's a very nice summary. Uh, and think of all these tables in three dimensions. Yes. And the X and Y axis are telling you, okay, increase contractility in the third dimension. I want you to think of why and how. How does one achieve increased contractility? So, yep, these tables are great for organizing thoughts. You need to dig deeper. You need to dig deeper. How is that coming about? And I just kind of briefly showed this. This was how to increase cardiac output. And it's showing by increasing in diastolic ventricular volume. That's filling the, that heart between beats. Between beats during diastole, you fill the heart with blood. And then you contract and eject some of that. And within, and I'll show you another slide within uh, a certain region, the more you fill the heart, the more you eject it out. And also sympathetics will also affect both heart rate and stroke volume. So cardiac output, remember, is heart rate times stroke volume. And you have 
couple of different mechanisms to help with that. And do remember that synthetics increase heart rate just withdrawing parasympathetic stimulation will increase heart rate. As you sit here relaxed in your new seats, um, you're under high parasympathetic tone. And just withdrawing the degree of parasympathetic stimulation going to the heart, the uh, fibers being carried by the vagus nerve, that, just think of parasympathetic, parasympathetic stimulation of the heart is like putting the brakes on. And if you take the brakes off, you immediately speed up. That's what will happen with your uh, heart rate. Uh, I gave you this, uh, this is kind of why I redid some notes. I, I thought, you know, there's some things coming up that we'll get to on Thursday that I kind of want you to have a preview of right now. And so this is that Frank Starling mechanism that we talked about with one of the ways in which you regulate stroke volume. Contractility is one, Frank Starling is the other. Frank Starling, the, within a wide range, as you fill the heart with more blood, you'll have more blood ejected. And it's due to a number of reasons, best cross, better cross bridge overlap, increased sensitivity to calcium, more release of calcium, uh, troponin sensitivity to calcium goes up. But the big, big underlying factor that regulates end diastolic volume. So this is how much blood fills the heart right before it contracts. So end diastolic volume, if you're if you have that cardiac cycle down, you know that in diastolic volume, that's the amount of blood in that ventricle right before it begins the depolarization, contraction. Well, it's you have to have the contraction and pressure generation and injection. So it's just right before you start the contraction. This is how much you fill the heart. So what are the primary determinants of that in diastolic volume? What determines how much that heart fills in between beads? And now you know that an increase in end diastolic volume is going to lead to an increase in stroke volume. So let's step it back the other direction. So whenever you have increased ventricular filling, that's going to increase your end diastolic volume. So if the ventricle fills with more blood between beats, okay, that's an increase in diastolic volume, that, that would be an increase in stroke volume. Well, what determines ventricular filling? There's a number of things, but one, one of the big things is venous return. Venous return. The more blood coming back to the heart every minute, the more the ventricles will fill every minute, and the more ejection you'll have every minute. So venous return, venous return coming into that right heart is going to preload that right ventricle with its end diastolic volume. That'll eject blood, and then what does that right heart ejection do? It, it's going to eventually preload the left heart right output supplies the left ventricle. So if something causes venous return to increase, it will cause increased ventricular filling, end up with an increased stroke volume. That's what's going on as we go up the line here. There's increased venous return. That's what's leading to that. So down here in this x-axis, uh, yeah, the uh, x-axis, Instead of saying in diastolic volume, somebody could put in ventricular filling. Somebody could put venous return. And that's going to look exactly the same way. Okay, so what can increase venous return? Now, veins don't, and there'll be some slides coming up, veins don't have the capacity to vasoconstrict 
dramatically, especially the great veins like the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, they too venoconstrict, but basically what they do is they become stiffer. And normally, veins have what's called high compliance. And we just very briefly talked about compliance, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, compliance, yes. Uh, refers to yielding the pressure. And veins, if you put pressure, blood pressure on them, they just bag out and they fill up with volume. But if they just stiffen up, if the great veins stiffen, that's a decrease in venous compliance. What does that do? That drives, there's one way valves on that venous side. So if that venous vasculature just stiffens up, what does that tend to do? Drive blood toward the heart. What causes venoconstriction? What causes a decrease in venous compliance? Well, sympathetic stimulation. Sympathetic stimulation is going to be a alpha-1 adrenergic receptor is going to lead to that venoconstriction, and that will help drive blood back to the heart. Another thing that drives blood to the heart is the skeletal muscle contraction pump. If you remember way back when you've had physiology before, especially in your lower body, but you know, all the peripheral body, when your muscles are contracting, they're generating this extravascular, meaning outside the blood vessel pressure. So your legs are contracting, the musculature of the legs are contracting. What does that do? That's squeezing on the veins. Those veins have one way valves, so when you squeeze that vein from the outside, it's like wringing the blood up toward the heart because of those one-way valves. So the skeletal uh, muscle contraction pump is very important for helping support venous return. We also have a respiratory pump. When you make a <gasps> inspiratory effort, you make your thoracic <coughs> cavity pressure uh, your intrapleural pressure more negative and that can help and then when you blow out when you are exhaling hard let's say during exercise you're contracting your abdominal muscles that's increasing pressure here so you have increased pressure here you have decreased pressure here and that's driving blood back up toward the heart so running Breathing fast, that helps support venous return. Also, what if you have an increase in plasma volume or an increase in blood volume? All those will help support venous return. Now, all these go in the opposite direction. What if sympathetics turn off? You lose venoconstriction. Venous return will go down. You stop exercising. Boy, did I learn this. I told a couple people in class. He used to work for the Cornhusker football team for five and a half years in the strength and conditioning program. That was years ago. And uh, anyway, we have a big lineman that we had this incredibly powerful cycle ergometer that we would do certain things with them. And so you had a 300 pound guy even way back then and they could just develop a massive amount of wattage and they would, they would only go like six, eight minutes and then you'd have them stop. And what would they do? they just, unless, well, I learned my lesson very, very quickly. It took an end of two. But these guys are cranking really hard. All this blood flow's going to their legs. It's like, okay, in. And they see that light goes off and they hang their legs. Well, they've lost their skeletal muscle contraction pump, so all that increased blood flow to the legs with nothing squeezing the blood back up toward the heart. And what do they do? Lights out and pass out. <laughs> and you know, by the time the second 300 pound lineman drops on top of you, and as soon as they fall flat, once their head is even with their heart, they become conscious just like that. You know, 
why are you down there? Why are you on top of me? <laughs> so you kind of forget when you're exercising, you know, yeah, you kind of cool out of it. And interestingly, the more fit somebody is, the more susceptible to you are to that rapid loss of consciousness. So these, when activated, it goes in this direction, but when these turn off, or let's say you have a hemorrhage, you have a hemorrhage and you have a dramatic, we're gonna talk a lot about that, you have a dramatic loss in blood volume, guess what? Venus return goes down, ventricular filling goes down, stroke volume goes down, we're going to see blood pressure goes down, person might be losing consciousness. Okay, so I just kind of wanted to talk about that. Afterload also impacts stroke volume, how much blood is ejected with each beat. Now I have some slides on here and there's going to be some loud sounds and unfortunately I couldn't turn them off. Uh, for some things coming up. Uh, but afterload, afterload is the amount of pressure the contracting ventricle sees once it begins to contract. So afterload is really aortic blood pressure and pulmonic blood pressure. So you know that when blood's ejected out into that aorta, from looking at those uh, cardiac cycle, you know blood pressure doesn't just drop to zero. If that ventricle drives aortic blood pressure up to 120, it will drop, but it doesn't drop like a rock. By the time the next contraction cycle comes around, maybe the pressure in the aorta has dropped to 80. So let's say we have somebody with blood pressure 120 over 80. That ventricle has to contract and generate a enough pressure to overcome 80. That 80, that blood pressure sitting out there in the aorta, if we're talking about the left heart, that's the afterload. So aortic blood pressure is the afterload that that left ventricle sees. After it starts to contract, what load does it have, does it see, and what does it have to overcome? So uh, think of it this way. The higher the afterload, any time that ventricle contracts, it just has so much energy. It has energy for pressure generation, and it has energy for blood ejection. So for any contraction, it needs to do those two things. It needs to generate pressure, it needs to eject blood. And the higher the afterload, the higher the blood pressure out there in the aorta, the more pressure that ventricle has to develop to then eject blood. So if, you, if the heart with a given beat spends more energy for pressure generation, there'll be less energy for blood ejection, and therefore stroke volume is going to go down. Okay? So, uh, with more energy used to overcome the afterload or blood pressure, there's less energy available for blood ejection. So increased afterload decreases ejection volume and therefore decreases stroke volume. Kind of make sense? Okay, so uh, some people were asking me about this type of thing and what this is referring to, let's look here at the left ventricle. If you look at that cardiac cycle diagram. The pressure inside that left ventricle, during diastole it's about zero, but during systole it might be 120. It's whatever the systolic pressure is. Now out here in the aorta, pressure just doesn't, you eject blood and it's 120, it doesn't just immediately drop. We're going to see in a couple slides to come that on the arterial side, when you eject blood out, part of the energy of that ejection phase, it actually will stretch out the walls of those arteries. So in between beats, those walls are collapsing back, keeping the blood pressurized, keeping blood flowing. So even in between beats, we have blood flow. Why? Those on the arterial tree, those vessels are snapping back and driving blood downstream. So the left ventricle might have a systolic pressure of 120. During diastole it might be as low as zero. Uh, on the, in the aorta it might be 120 over 80. Now the right heart, we're talking about a much lower pressure system. So this 
rejection, stroke volume is going to go down. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Now this is where it's going to get noisy. Oh, okay. So imagine, if you will, that here's the uh, aorta, and yes, there is a back pressure coming against the aortic valve. So every time that left ventricle contracts, it's like it has to push a door open to get the blood to eject. So ugh, I'm sorry for what's about to happen. So during that ejection, it has to drive open that door. That takes some energy. It takes some energy. So because there's back pressure, there's back pressure on that door. There's a little bit of wind on the other side. It's aortic pressure, right? So, but if the amount of back pressure on that aortic valve is higher, 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 which occurs during uh, high blood pressure or hypertension, guess what? That ventricle has to do more and more pressure generation just so it can eject blood. So, sorry, I was going to try to turn it off before class. So, you have this pressure generation and then ejection. So, with hypertension, there's an abnormally high afterload that greatly increases myocardial work and oxygen demand, and therefore, it decreases stroke volume. So, oftentimes, people with hypertension, guess what? They just have a, they have a higher heart rate because their stroke volumes are going down. They still need to maintain their cardiac output, so they're beating faster. Their heart's working harder. And we're gonna, you're going to have a lot of slides on this to come. I just wanted to put this in perspective. Now, with severe hypertension, I, when I teach continuing education to practitioners, I say, this is like trying to pump blood against a brick wall. It's just like whack, whack. There's a tremendous amount of hindrance to blood ejection. You have to generate huge pressures to be able to pop open that aortic valve because there's so much back pressure. So much back pressure. So does that change the amount of work that your mind part your heart has to do? Absolutely. I hate this term, but you're going to find out, I'll give you a little preview, what determines myocardial work, how much work the heart has to do to eject blood. It's C-R-A-P, crap. Contractility, increased contractility takes more energy, more oxygen. Increased heart rate takes more energy. It requires more oxygen, therefore more blood flow. Increased afterload, this is a big increase afterload. The heart has to do more work. Increased preload, filling the heart with more blood between beats. That takes more work. So, as you go through your day and you go from sitting to walking to, you know, maybe jogging, uh, taking off to an increased physical activity, your heart is doing more work. And your blood vessels can accommodate that increased myocardial work and increased coronary artery blood flow to meet the metabolic demands for that increased work. But somebody with coronary artery disease and their coronary blood flow is compromised as my, these determinants of myocardial work go up, <coughs> they may become limited in their uh, ability to do physical activity because it's very easy in those people to too much crap, you can't do any more work, basically. And yet, I, I truly hate that word, but this, um, a graduate student who I knew, she was in her oral exams, and she was asked a question on this about determinants of myocardial work in this one cardiovascular compromised patient, and she writes C-R-A-P. And you know, the senior, senior faculty and us are like, what the heck? It's a legitimate question. Why are you doing this? It's just, no, this is getting. And, and it had never occurred to any of us that it's crap <laughs> until Betty Dowdy wrote that on the platform during an oral exam. We all, from that point on, for close to 20 years, 
All of us that have been, were around that have been teaching, we use crap and never, nobody ever forgets it. Nobody ever forgets it. Okay, so yeah, we're pumping it against a brick wall. That ventricle's doing a lot of work and we're getting a lot of annoying sounds. Okay, so that's just kind of put it in perspective. So now we're gonna look, go down the vascular tree, look at the arterial side, get at the capillaries, get to the venous side. I just hope we can get quite a way through the arterial, arterial. So yes, we talked about that heart being this wonderful twin pump that's highly regulated. Well, guess what? Think of the vasculature as conduits, these tubes, and flow through those individual tubes, highly regulated. Sometimes you want a lot of flow here, but not much flow here. Not much flow here. So there are some structural characteristics when you go down the vascular tree that really impacts its function. The way arteries are put together, the way arterials are put together, the way capillaries are put together, how the venous side is put together, that really impacts their function. Now, many of you have heard this term before. Arteries store pressure, veins store volume. Now that's simplistic, but it really does make sense. We're going to see that during the ejection phase, some of the energy is going to stretch the walls of the arterial tree. They're going to store pressure. So in between beats, those blood vessels will collapse back down to their normal size, keeping blood pressurized, keeping flow going down the vascular tree. On the venous side, it can just kind of bag out during relaxation, something like 60% of your blood can just be in the great veins. So that, think about that. In your great veins, the last vessels before that blood goes back to the right heart, to the right atrium, you've just got a massive amount of blood sitting out there. So if something suddenly stimulates a stiffening of those veins or the skeletal muscle contraction pump is activated or the thoracic respiratory pump is activated, you have all this volume that you can quickly send to the heart. It's a ready reserve. It's sitting on the bench ready to go into the game. So blood flows down its pressure gradient. So this left heart generates a very high pressure and blood can then blow, flow all the way to the vasculature to that right atrium. It's going to go from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So just like all gradients, gradients drive physiologic processes here. We're talking about pressure gradients. Now it turns out these arterioles are absolutely essential for distribution of blood flow. Sometimes you want blood flowing here and not so much here. And in their regulation of distribution of blood flow, they're also regulating blood pressure. So arterioles are just central to the distribution of blood flow. And it's dynamic, it's regulated. Sometimes you want this one to get a lot of blood flow, other times not much. Regulation's right here at the arterioles, okay? So what regulates you already know that small changes in the radius of a tube huge changes in resistance to flow. So small amounts of arterial vasoconstriction, <coughs> small amounts of arterial vasodilation, you have dramatic differences in resistance and therefore differences in blood flow. So here's the way your book kind of shows, and the more I look at this illustration, the more I like it. Here are the structural components of the vascular tree. You look at the aorta and the large arteries, and you see what they're showing here, there's a lot of blue elastic tissue. Elastic tissue that can distend, and in vascular physiology, elasticity is the uh, property of being able to snap back. In tissue science, elasticity is the ability to distend. That's not the way you think of it in cardiovascular. Elasticity is snapping back. So imagine when you blow up a balloon, 
it has elastic recoil potential. If you let go, it will snap back. So, and so that's what these blue are. There's several layers of elastic stretchable tissue and you can stretch it during periods of high pressure and then uh, in between beats that will snap back, pressurizing blood, keeping it flowing down the mass of the tree. You can come down to arterioles and what do these guys have? You know, yeah, there's not nearly as much elastic tissue in this wall, but what they have is smooth muscle. Smooth muscle that is can be regulated in a number of ways, leading to vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Come down here to capillaries. Capillaries are just these thin, they're just one layer of endothelial cells. And if you look, there's endothelium here, there's endothelium here, there's endothelium here, there's endothelium here. So all the blood vessels have this single layer of endothelium. It's just capillaries, that's all they are. That's all they are, is endothelial cells. So endothelial cells make up the endothelium. And then we'll talk about the veins a little bit later on. So you can store pressure because of the elasticity on the arterial side. You can regulate distribution of blood flow at the arterioles because of the smooth muscle. It has the ability to either vasoconstrict or vasodilate on the demand. And we have one-way valves on the venous side. And because these are, this is so distensible, things like skeletal muscle contraction or ventilatory pressures can help drive the blood back to the heart on the venous side. And we can store a whole lot of blood there. Store a whole lot of blood, so if you suddenly increase physical activity or increase in anxiety, all you have to do is stiffen that up a little bit because of one-way valves, you're sending more blood to the heart to prepare for that challenge. Okay, so uh, this gets to, uh, I guess I hadn't really talked about it. I don't know, I've probably talked very briefly. Compliance, we're, you're, we're gonna hear about this term compliance several times throughout the balance of the semester. Compliance refers to yielding the pressure. And the, I'll tell you the example that I give in dental students. So dental students, you'll have, they'll have patients that come in who, some they come in, they have kind of poor oral hygiene. They're not brushing the flossing very well. They have poor plaque, their plaque screen is high. So one patient, you might say, you know, you need to do a little bit more between visits. Uh, before cleaning, so I, I want you to you know, pay more attention, do more brushing, more flossing. So you're putting some pressure on a patient. And you're going to be putting pressure on patients all the time. Your heart disease, your hypertension patients, your uh, diabetic patients, to try to modify lifestyle behaviors. You're going to do it in a very gentle and supportive way, but you will be putting pressure on your patients. So those dental students are putting pressure on the patients to increase their oral hygiene. So a low compliance patient, very little effect. So with a low compliance pressure, you give X amount of pressure on them and very little impact. They come back in, no change whatsoever. A highly compliant patient, somebody who yields to pressure very readily, they come back in and they have these red swollen gums. I'm up to brushing an hour and a half a day and I, I'm now flossing five times a day and they're just destroying their periodontia. Very little pressure and you have this huge change in behavior. So that's kind of what goes on here. Here it's a change in volume for a given change in pressure. Some blood vessels, such as these great veins, you pressurize the blood a little bit and they just stand out. A little bit of a change in pressure and a huge change in volume. That's low compliance, or excuse me, high compliance. Something that's high compliance, a small change in pressure, a large change in volume. On the arterial side, we have exactly the opposite thing. 
we have a low compliance system. High changes in pressure, low changes in volume. And once we put these things into action, then they'll make a lot more sense. They'll make a lot more sense. So keep them and look in your book about how they describe compliance. Okay, so we're gonna get into compliance right here. So here's the way the book shows the aorta. And so during the systolic phase of that ventricle, during ventricular systole, you have pressure generation and then you have ejection. You can see the aortic valve is now open. So during the ejection phase, yep, some blood is flowing from left to right and down the vascular tree, but some because of we have a pressure gradient. Lower pressure, higher pressure. So blood's going to flow from there to high pressure to low pressure. But just like when you blow on a balloon, when you jam X amount of blood into this blood vessel, part of that blood is going to actually distend the walls of that blood vessel. Remember, there's elastic layers in there. There's elastic layers. So, even during diastole, this is great the way it's built. Because if this was a purely rigid tube, if this was a purely rigid tube and it didn't distend out, what would happen is you have blood flow during systole, and then during diastole, nothing. Blood flow would stop. But what happens is when you eject blood out during systole, during diastole, when that aortic valve is closed, those vascular walls, those arterial vascular walls, they start snapping back down to their original size. What does that do? That maintains blood pressure. That maintains blood flow. So right here, pressure went all the way up to 120. And then during diastole, as this is snapping back, it goes from 120, the pressure in here goes from 120 to 110 to 100 uh, to 90 to 80. And right when it gets to 80, we have another systolic phase. So we reset it back to 120. But because of these distensile, elastic arteries, we store pressure. So arteries store pressure. And this is kind of what this is talking about here. So if you look at the blood pressure tracing, this would be for systemic circulation. This is for pulmonary circulation. And this is what's going on. Uh, in the arteries, here's when we get to the arterioles, but we can see that during systole, blood pressure goes way up. During diastole, it's falling, 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 falling. Before it falls all the way to zero, we have another ventricular contraction phase. And we repressurize the blood, repressurize the blood. So what you're seeing here are pulse pressures. And it, much less pressure generation on the pulmonary side. But it doesn't just automatically drop to zero. It drops over a period of time because the elastic recoil, that's really what those vessels have. They have elastic recoil potential, snapping back, keeping the pressures high, higher than what they would be without. So um, I now have a new appreciation, thanks to Aaron, for the diacritic notch. I will never dismiss it again. Uh, she will fill you in on why it's important. So let's look at some, some terms here. So systolic pressure. Systolic pressure is the aortic blood pressure, the highest blood pressure developed in the arterial tree during the systolic phase, so maximum arterial pressure occurring during ventricular systole, max systolic pressure. Diastolic pressure is the minimum blood pressure that occurs during a cardiac cycle. So that's occurring during ventricular diastole, and before it has a chance to drop even farther, hey, we reactivate the heart, we're gonna go through another 
depolarization, contraction, pressure generation, ejection phase again. So, pulse pressure is something you need to know, and all that is is systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. So here are pulse pressures. And Aaron would know a lot about this, but arterial sclerosis, the hardening of the arteries uh, used to be called that, but uh, with peripheral artery disease, you'll see changes. Changes, these vessels, these arteries become less elastic and it changes uh, pulse pressures quite a bit. Pulse pressure is diagnostic, a, one of the diagnostic indicators of arterial sclerosis. And look at what happens to the vascular tree with age, and down here is somebody 40, 60, 80. What happens as somebody ages and the blood vessels on the arterial side become less and less elastic? There's higher systolic pressure because of that loss of elasticity, and they have lower diastolic pressures. So they don't stretch as much, they don't recoil as much, and therefore you have these huge, well, these increasing, increasing pulse pressures. Mean arterial blood pressure might not change a whole lot, but pulse pressure does. And that's, well, you definitely see that. I mean, many of you have uh, older relatives, and something ever happens, and you're, they're on a continuous monitor, they go, Pulse pressure in there. And that's because of some peripheral artery disease. Okay, so mean arterial blood pressure. Mean arterial blood pressure. This is the average blood pressure on the arterial side over the course of a cardiac cycle. So uh, your book goes MAP, and actually, I use for most of the things I'll be showing you, I go MABP. So MAP and MABP are the same thing in my notes. Actually, for many of the slides coming up, I'll have MABP. I wish I'd have remembered that. Uh, so mean, or, mean arterial blood pressure is the average blood pressure over a cardiac cycle. Now, diastole takes twice as long as systole, typically. So here's one way of calculating mean arterial blood pressure. There's two primary ways, but here's one way. Diastolic pressure plus one-third pulse pressure. So if somebody has a blood pressure of 120 over 80, so 80 would be the diastolic pressure. Their pulse pressure is 120 minus 80, so 40. So one-third of 40 is about 30. So their mean arterial blood pressure would be like 93.3 millimeters of mercury pressure. And that it's that mean arterial blood pressure that is the average driving force for blood flow through the vascular system. So, as I mentioned, these tubes downstream here, we're going to leave the arteries and build the arterioles. It's these arterioles, they're kind of a gatekeeper on how much blood individual tissues, individual organs get. And how do they primarily regulate how much blood that these individual tissues and organs get? By regulating the resistance to blood flow at those points. And you already know that most of that is regulated by the radius of the blood vessel. So arterioles, they really are central for the distribution of blood flow to specific organs and tissues. The ones that need it the most get the most. The ones that need it the least get the least in a normal, healthy person. And it's to remember the radius of the two. Resistance is one over radius to the fourth power. Small changes in radius leads to huge changes and resistance. <coughs> so your book has a nice illustration that here all of these tubes have the same pressure, the same blood pressure at 
be opening of each of these tubes, but different tubes have different, have each, they each have a different radius. So here we have a little bit of constriction, lower, more resistance, lower blood flow. No restriction, more blood flow. Really dramatic decrease in the uh, radius of the tube, even less blood flow and so on and so forth. So this is what's going on during period A. During period B, very quickly, very quickly, by just changing the radius. And these are showing huge changes in the radio right here. And it's actually small changes that lead to this big change <coughs> in resistance and big change in blood flow. Because remember, it's resistance is proportional to one over radius to the fourth power. So small changes here with vasoconstriction and vasodilation, big changes in blood flow, big changes in blood flow. So how do you regulate arterial resistance? There are a number of ways. There's multiple factors. There's extrinsic factors. Now, most of them come down to calcium. You're regulating the contractile state of the smooth muscle of the arterial. So in most cases, it comes down to calcium. Think back to what regulates smooth muscle contraction. Well, it's calcium. So if you're going to vasoconstrict, guess what? You do something that increases calcium where the process is the calcium. And you get vasoconstriction. If you want to vasodilate, you either stop the release of calcium or you stop the impact of what calcium does. And that will affect smooth muscle contraction. Now, many, many, you're going to see a bunch of examples coming out. Many medications regulate arterial uh, resistance by directly regulating uh, smooth muscle systolic calcium or by activating and blocking the controls that we're going to see coming up. So calcium, calcium, calcium. Local arterial controls. Now, we're going to see local controls versus extrinsic controls. Local control is what's going on right here at the tissue? What's going on right here at the tissue? An extrinsic control might be a sympathetic neuron coming down and communicating with this. Local controls almost always predominate over what's going to happen with blood flow. So local control is almost always, by far, the greatest determinant of if that organ or tissue has low resistance to high blood flow or vice versa. Now, what kind of local controls are, that, are there that I talked about? One thing are local, locally produced metabolites. The more metabolically active this tissue is right here, the more metabolites it's going to be producing, and also the lower the oxygen is. So let's say this is a very, very metabolically active tissue. Something's going on. Let's say digestion's going on. Well, oxygen's going to be consumed, so oxygen's going to go down. Guess what? That vasodilates. CO2 is going to be produced because that's producing a lot of work. Hey, that causes vasodilation. There's all sorts of local metabolites, and they are different for different tissues. Some tissues, these metabolites will cause vasodilations in other tissues. It's other metabolites that are produced when that tissue's getting busy. But in many cases, in almost all cases, the generation of metabolites cause vasodilation. So the more metabolically active tissue, uh, it requires more blood flow. So arterial smooth muscle, it's highly sensitive to metabolites. So locally produced metabolites actually cause vasodilation. So the tissue that is most active is producing more metabolites. That leads to more vasodilation. That leads to more blood flow. What a beautiful system. The more you need, the more you're going to get. And that's the vast majority in a normal, healthy person how 
blood flow is distributed to the organs that need it. There's also a myogenic response that, and, and this isn't in all arterioles, but if blood pressure is high, that might distend some of these arterial walls, and some of them then have a reflex basal constriction. So both of these are built into the arterial. They, it happens locally. So if a tissue is very, very active in producing a lot of metabolites, well, it vasodilates and allows more blood to get there. But what if blood pressure goes up, it stretches out the arterial, and the arterial goes, eh, we don't want more blood flow to this area. You get a myogenic response, which is a reflex muscle contraction. So what does that do? That keeps blood pressure, or excuse me, it keeps blood flow in a normal range. I'll show you an example of this. And it goes the and both of these go in the other direction. If you have a metabolically inactive tissue, you're not producing vasodilating metabolites, you're going to get some vasoconstriction. If blood pressure goes down, almost all arterial smooth muscle has a basal tone. So you can vasoconstrict a little bit, or you can vasodilate a little bit. They're kind of in the middle kind of in the middle. So if blood pressure goes down, well, guess what? If blood pressure goes down, you get a little bit of vasodilation because of this myogenic response is turned off. You can't really make a, not all arterials behave this way. You're going to hear about some specific examples for some courses to come. Now, those are local factors. Those are local factors controlling distribution of blood flow by regulating resistance. Let's look at extrinsic factors. What, out, what factors outside of the arterial smooth muscle can influence the arterial smooth muscle? Well, sympathetic nervous system activation, front and center. So many arterioles have alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, and you know alpha-1 when norepinephrine or epinephrine bind alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, it turns on an IP3 calcium signal transduction process. So all of a sudden you have the release of calcium into the cytosol, you get vasoconstriction. So for many different arterioles, and this is the way this, is the way this works. Imagine that this is your gut, right here, this is your skin, let's say this is the, the muscles of your legs, and you start to walk very, very fast. That turns on your sympathetic nervous system. What does that do? It causes vasoconstriction here at the gut and here at your skin, but down here your active muscles, they're producing metabolites, so you get vasodilation. The local effect, even though sympathetic outflow would be coming down here, local metabolites almost always win the battle. Okay, now there is uh, an exception to this A, is, for example, in skeletal muscle. Some skeletal muscle beds, they have beta-2 adrenergic receptors, so when there's a little bit of epinephrine in the system, epinephrine is far better at binding beta-2 adrenergic receptors and norepinephrine. So if your adrenal medulla is releasing some epinephrine and those skeletal muscles that have some of these beta-2 adrenergic receptors, that actually causes vasodilation. So you increase blood flow to those active skeletal muscles. So that's, that is an important exception. Now there's also hormonal control that they can actually uh, your textbook puts this under hormonal control. I'm not going to split hairs, but this to me is part of the sympathetic nervous system. So, you're going to see more about this later on, but there are some important hormones that very much regulate vascular tone. Angiotensin II is a powerful, powerful vasoconstrictor. And you're going to see that 
there's some things that can happen in the kidney that can turn on a process that leads to production of angiotensin II. And it's a powerful vasoconstrictor. And it's released, for example, when you have a hemorrhage to help maintain blood pressure. Vasopressin, the other name for vasopressin is antidiuretic hormone. They're the same molecule. It's also a vasoconstrictor. It's also a vasoconstrictor. Both of these, when they bind their own receptors, activate IP3 calcium signal transduction pathways. Now, atrial natriuretic peptide. This is actually released from the atria of the heart. This is a vasodilator. And we'll see when we get to the renal system how, and also the endocrine system, how these all work together. But these are hormones that have a big impact on vascular control throughout the body. And then there are other factors. And the only other factor that I'm going to mention is there are some neurons. There are some neurons that directly release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a smooth muscle relaxant. Many of the vasodilating metabolites, they actually function by causing nitric oxide to be produced in that arteriosmooth muscle. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And there are some neurons that will release nitric oxide into smooth muscle beds. So I do want you to generally know nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So this is the table uh, 1239 that summarizes everything we've been talking about. So local controls, hormonal controls, neural controls, all this information going to arterial smooth muscle. Now, not all arterial smooth muscle, not all arterials will have the receptors for each of these or have each of them. Uh, so, but overall, all of these play a role. All of these play a role. But any individual arterial might be more sensitive to one of these controls than others. But always remember, in a normal healthy person, you might have the uh, neural control sympathetic nervous system turned on. And what does that do? It's going to be causing vasoconstriction in non-essential organs. But in those organs that are metabolically very active, they're producing local metabolites. So they're going to be getting most of the blood flow. So at any minute, you have cardiac output, blood leaving that heart, blood leaving the heart. And the beauty of the body, the body knows, OK, we're under challenge. We turn on this fight or flight uh, response. We're facing a challenge. And what do sympathetics do? They tend to decrease blood flow in every place except where it's metabolically active in the locals, really predominate. So it's a great system. It's a great system. We're going to just decrease blood flow generally, but those tissues that are very active right now, they can overcome that sympathetic stimulation and set their blood flow themselves by local vasodilating mediators. So if they need it, they get it. Okay, some Here's three examples of uh, dynamic flow regulation responses. Active hyperemia, active hyperemia. This is what happens during exercise. Active hyperemia means that with increased metabolic demand, there's increased blood flow to the area. So if you go out jogging, if you go out jogging, the uh, you're going to increase production of metabolites. And what is that going to do? You're going to have an increase in blood flow to those. You don't have this slide? Yes, you do. OK. OK, so as you're exercising, you're going to be producing more of these vasodilating local mediators. And what does that do? That actively increases blood flow to that area. 
So with activity, you have hyperemia, an increase in blood flow. That's what hyperemia means, condition of elevated or excessive blood flow. So with more metabolic demand, you have more blood flow. Just what we were talking about, local control. Reactive hyperemia. Imagine, if you will, for whatever reason, blood flow to a specific area is occluded for a period of time. Maybe a quarter second, one second, or two minutes. You have some type of occlusion to blood flow, so blood's not getting to that area. What's happening? These, meta these metabolites, these local vasodilating metabolites, they're accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. So the arterial smooth muscle is just relaxing more and more and more. If that occlusion is relieved, you have this huge compensatory increase in blood flow. This actually is what happens during the cardiac cycle when the heart beats, when that left ventricle contracts, it generates so much pressure, it actually squeezes shut the arteries during the systolic phase. So for a, a tenth of a second, those ventricular myocytes are producing these uh, metabolites, so during diastole, those vessels open even more and you get a reactive hyperemia. Several tissues undergo what's called flow autoregulation. Some tissues like your kidneys and your brain, they just want X amount of blood flow every minute. I don't care if blood pressure goes up or blood pressure goes down, I want to just get my blood flow. And it looks something like this. Typically, the set point's right here in the middle. So, let's say these are your, this is your kidneys. And what if, and so this is perfusion pressure, and perfusion pressure is what is the blood pressure that is perfusing or providing flow to a specific organ. And let's say, the starting point, the starting points are almost always dead set in the middle. What happens if somebody's blood pressure goes down a little bit? Well, perfusion pressure goes down, uh, flow stays the same. Why? As pressure goes down, resistance goes down. So flow stays the same. What if perfusion pressure goes up? If perfusion pressure goes up, resistance to flow goes up, so the flow stays the same. Now when you get to the ends, yeah, you can overcome this autoregulatory zone, but there are specific organs that work very hard, that no matter what, what's going on with blood pressure, within a fairly wide range, it keeps blood flow per minute very much the same. That's called autoregulation. That's just a term you need to know. And so this organ is regulating blood flow by regulating resistance to keep it in that normal range. So here's some, I, this is a preview that I was hoping to get to. And you have it for some things that are to come uh, next time. So yeah, we've already talked about mean arterial blood pressure. I want to, and earlier on, we talked about this. Flow is equal to the change in pressure divided by resistance. So the greater the change in pressure, the greater the change in flow. If resistance goes up, flows goes down, right? Let's kind of play with this equation a little bit. So when we're talking about flow through the entire systemic circulation, we're talking about flow coming from the left ventricle going all the way back to the right atrium. We need to have a pressure gradient for flow to go in that direction, okay? So if we want to just substitute this, what's this change in pressure? Well, aortic pressure, right atrial pressure. That's the pressure gradient that drives flow. And then there's a resistance of flow that's provided by the vasculature across the body. So right atrial pressure
pressure hits zero. Hits zero. So really, what is the gradient? Well, the gradient's actually your mean arterial blood pressure, which you just calculated up here, minus zero. So really, it's flow is equal to mean arterial blood pressure divided by resistance. That's the equation. This is one form to know, but remember back in arithmetic how you, you learned how to rearrange equations? Well, let's do that. This is why you, you took uh, probably in fifth and sixth grade. You got to rearrange equations. You rearrange it like this. Mean arterial blood pressure is a product of flow times resistance. That's what determines your mean arterial blood pressure. And what, what is this flow we're talking about? The flow we're talking about is cardiac output. Cardiac output is the flow that's part of the product of arterial blood pressure, and then there's resistance to that flow. So, what is mean arterial blood pressure? Blood pressure. Mean arterial blood pressure is actually cardiac output times the total amount of resistance out here in the periphery. So you'll hear total peripheral resistance and total systemic resistance mean the very same thing. Total peripheral resistance and total uh, systemic resistance mean the very same thing. You can break down cardiac output, as you know, the heart rate times stroke volume. Now why the heck did I, now I want you, between now and Thursday, I really want you to think about this. I want you to think about this and really get comfortable with this equation and where it came from. A lot of thought on this page. Why? Here's just a little preview. So, oh boy, we have sound. So, during uh, diastole, we have ventricular filling, and during systole, we have uh, ventricular ejection. And uh, when you guys are doing blood pressure, you're probably not going straight to the aorta to do it. But, you know, <laughs> this is during the ejection phase, you're setting the systolic pressure, and then it drops, 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 and it's minimum that it reaches before the next systolic phase, that's diastolic pressure, okay? So you know that, you know that. So what I'm getting to here is here are all the different classes of antihypertensive medications. And what we're gonna be doing is here is that equation. Here's that equation. And this is just one of those sit back and look at things. So if you're really comfortable with that equation and where it came from, this is going to make a lot of sense to you. I wish I would have given you, I didn't give you that slide, did I? Bad on me. But what regulates heart rate? Well, the sympathetic nervous system. What regulates stroke volume, contractility, and preload? Okay, we've already talked about that. What regulates total peripheral resistance? Well, which we talked about it obliquely, arterial vasoconstriction. Arterial vasoconstriction. And within each of those, there are specific things that are regulated there. So diuretics, diuretics are, we're gonna get a bunch of slides on this, so don't try to sit down and write anything down. Diuretics, what do they do? They work on this part of the equation. Diuretics will drop blood pressure because they're gonna decrease stroke volume. What do beta blockers do? Beta blockers have a lot of effects. Beta blockers are going to decrease Heart rate, beta blockers are going to decrease contractility. Beta blockers are going to decrease the release of something called renin. And renin kicks off a cascade that leads to the production of angiotensin II, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor. So, beta blockers, beta blockers will block in a whole number of ways. ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors will Block this part, we'll block this part. Here's ACE, an ACE inhibitor drug, blocks right there. So it stops vasoconstriction and it decreases sodium and water retention. Angiotensin II receptor blockers, well, they're very specific, but what they do, they're called ARBs. They function here. Aldosterone receptor blockers. 
function here. So the point is, if you really, really, really feel this equation, management of blood pressure just makes a lot of sense. You know that calcium, calcium plays a central role in the tone of arterial smooth muscle. So, not a surprise, there are calcium channel blockers. They're not used for everything, but calcium channel blockers, they will decrease contractility of the heart. They will decrease ventricular compli venous compliance. They will decrease arterial vasoconstriction. All those things drop blood pressure. Alpha blockers, well, they're just going to impact here and here. And it goes on and on and on. So this, if you have time, I hope you write this down. I hope you write this down. Because uh, this is where I want to sit through today. This is something that you just start thinking about right now. Here are the elements of controlling mean arterial blood pressure. And within each of these elements, there's different controls for that. Cardiovascular fits, one thing builds on another, builds on another, builds on another. I better get the crap off the board or surprised by truly understanding all the elements of this equation, how you will understand the pathology of so many different cardiovascular conditions and the pharmacology of so many different drugs. Now, how many of you Friday morning center for those people who want to do it. Can you sure we'll have this room available? Okay. Uh, we will have, uh, we'll go over these example questions for the neurophys. You're like a good multitasker, right? <laughs> 